Okay, welcome back. Um, we were looking at chapter three, where our focus is on how do you make a choice uh, to find to to marriage. Uh, how do you find and uh, what do you do to work towards making that choice? We did uh, discover um, four areas of compatibility. We looked at some warning signs that we need to consider to be addressed and to be sorted out. We looked at um, uh, expectations of how it's important for us to jot down needed expectations of marriage, what we would like to see as qualities and traits in the person we want to marry, what kind of a home and family do we have um, visualized in the way we see marriage. Um, we also looked at a certain question uh, on is there an appointed one and only. We looked at it through the story of uh, how Abraham's servant goes to find a bride and how um, uh, Rebecca was in a, was in a position or in a place of making that decision of, and how Abraham's servant did not override that decision or her family's decision but went depended on God's guidance um, and also looked at the person looked at Rebecca in making that choice so that's that's where we we were to so any questions um, up to this point if not let's uh, move forward in um uh, even as as we look in on other certain points on making a choice in marriage, any questions here? Okay, all right. So let's uh, move forward um, to uh, to um, uh, discuss a couple more of points. Even as uh, we've you know we keep we've kept reiterating this, this one truth that um, uh, marriage is not just about finding the right person, but it is also being the right person, right? So it's not only about finding the right person, but also uh, what being the right person and what you can do to build a healthy relationship and a healthy, uh, a healthy marriage. Okay, so uh, the the common question that again we're looking for is how do we do the seeking? How do we search? What do we? How can we come to a place of? Uh, how do we do the seeking? Okay, so again we uh, we need to understand that there isn't any perfect person. There is no perfect partner. There is nothing called a perfect partner. So it is not about finding the perfect person. Okay, um, it's it is to it is to come to a process of being able to doing the seeking, the asking, and the knocking. As you see in Matthew seven seven to eleven, it talks of ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. Okay. So with whatever you have, we have learned up to now in this chapter, it's important to step forward to uh, to go find, to seek, uh, to maybe ask and to knock, um, to find the right person while you are trusting God uh, to guide you and to bring you to the most suitable person for your life. Okay, um, uh, God brings you to to. The, the person who is right, but not the perfect person. Okay, remember that everyone, all of us, keep uh, keep progressing, keep keep growing, keep changing, and uh, what we are looking at is only certain guidelines when you are seeking the person. Okay, um, so one of one some of the ways that you can seek is uh, it wherever you are. Right, wherever in your own community, in your own church community, wherever you are in your local church community, um, you know you may be engaging with a lot of people with with the larger community. So pray and consider if there may be people uh, who may be suitable for you, or who may be um, the person God you feel is God is directing you to, and 
But once that hap once once you're able to identify that, get the help of some mentors or some leaders um, in, in in your community. All right. Uh, uh, before you know, before you approach someone, get the support and the help of other leaders or mentors in your church. Also, you can also look beyond looking into other churches or any other uh, websites or matrimonial uh, um, probably events or programs. Uh, uh, you know, attending some of that, like like in a city like Bangalore, there are times that there are young singles meet uh, you know young youth meet together and there's nothing wrong in 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 seeking and uh, at all the possible avenues or opportunities that you have access to because god can help and direct you through different ways in being able to help you find a suitable person so be open to how god would desire to work through in your life it could also be in in opening this up to your family, where where families are open to seeking people and getting you in touch with that, that's also uh, another way. There are there are many ways that it can be done, depending on the kind of cultural context you are in and where you are. So when you make the decision on uh, on the person you're going to ma uh, marry, remember it is many things. You are being led by the Spirit of God. You are keeping in tune with what God's word says. You are using the um, uh, the uh, wisdom, the knowledge, the judgment, the understanding you have from God. Uh, you are also taking the counsel of people uh, around. So when you um, when you utilize all of this together, you can be assured that you are making the right right decision okay so an, another question that that often comes up especially in the context of finding someone to marry is how do does one discern god's gu guidance how do you understand and walk in the guidance that god is is giving you okay so just putting you to through a couple of uh, scriptures um uh, Ephesians 5.17 says, understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay, and how do we do that is when we are not conformed to the world, Romans 12.2, when we're not conformed to the world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So it, uh, that's what scripture teaches us. The renewed mind, what does the renewed mind do? The renewed mind is able to help understand to be help to to reason uh, to see what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of god when the mind is renewed when it is in accordance to the word of god um, sorry yeah uh, it takes so when when the renewed mind um uh, um uh, the renewed mind is is a place where you can discern and understand and reason what God's will is for you. So it and and while you're doing that, it also takes the guidance or it takes the understanding, the wisdom the Holy Spirit gives you to understand and know what the will of God is. So when you're when you're discerning the guidance of God, you're working. You're um, you're using the mind the renewed mind that is that is that has been um that looks at what god's will is for your life as well as listening to the to the holy spirit and also thinking through practical things using the wisdom and understanding that god has given you in the word and by his spirit so as you're seeking the guidance of god about who you should marry it's important to take uh, these th these following questions or these following um, aspects into consideration. So first and foremost is you know as you as you feel that the Holy Spirit is guiding you, right, uh, and and you you're being led to under to led to a person. The first question you may need to check and ask for yourself is: Does this person have the traits and the qualities that I have been seeking for? That I have put down in my expectation list. Okay, is that is that something that I see? Are there are the traits and the qualities uh, that I'm looking for? Is it something that I can see in the person? 
then is to see if there is compatibility in those areas, the spiritual, the uh, physical, the emotional, and the calling that's there in life. That's, that's again, what you would look, look for. Then looking to see if the person is prepared for marriage uh, and uh, is, is, are they showing signs of preparation? Okay. The next thing you would look for is, are there any specific warning signs that, uh, that you notice? And is it something that has been adequately addressed? Then you would look for, is there anything that uh, indicates to you, any, any circumstance that is there externally that indicates to you that God is guiding you through this? There may be certain orchestration of certain circumstances happen in such a way that God is guiding you into making making a choice. Okay. Uh, next is, is the, is the Holy Spirit leading you uh, into this decision? Do you feel the peace of God about this entire situation? Is this something that is mutual? Is the other person also ready to say yes? Are you also in a place to say yes? Is there support from others, maybe the parents or, or other people that you hold dear. Um, uh, is, is that something that you see? But uh, at the same time, we do know and understand that this may not be possible in every situation, especially when um, parents uh, do not see the importance of your faith in choosing a partner, right? So if that if that were that sometimes we you, we may not see that, but overall you're looking to see if there is support from parents. And lastly, is there support um, from spiritual elders uh, who look uh, who oversee your life? So these are some of the uh, recommendations that you that you take in as you discern God's guidance. Looking at uh, listening to the Holy Spirit. Now, through by being renewed in your mind, you're able to reason and understand. Um, uh, you know, if your choice is is according to what what God's desire is, and also think, think, thinking through this with wisdom and understanding by what is given in the Word and the and the Holy Spirit. With that, you consider these things in order to make your choice, in order to understand what God's guidance is in this matter. Okay, now. Once um, th there can be a point of time that uh, uh, you know, even even as you may have decided to be married, uh, it may take you some time. It may take you a while to find the person or to come uh, to meet someone who you would like to marry. Which means you are going to be in waiting. Which means uh, it takes patient waiting. So while you are waiting, what do you do? Romans twelve two says. Be joyful, be patient, and pray at all times. So it says to be joyful and to be patient and to pray at all times. Hebrews 11 one says to have faith that the things that you hope for is something that you will see. Be certain. You'll be certain of the things that you cannot see at this point of time. Okay. So the, the search, although it can take some time, even as you're waiting and looking for a life partner, uh, you continue to to live in hope, continue to be joyful, continue to be patient, continue to do what you need to in this current time of life. All because you're waiting, you do not need to abort everything else around your life. You can continue to stay focused and busy with what God is giving you to do. To do. And this is the right time to be able to work on yourself, to build yourself, to edify, to develop yourself, and growing in uh, what God has called you to do. So it's not just staying passively and idly boredom uh, with complaining, with bickering while you're waiting, but it is a time to be engaged in, uh, in preparing yourself, in continuing to do, number one, what you've been called to do, and, and what your larger calling for life is. So the, the waiting period is a lot more, um, uh, uh, it has a lot more activity than, than, than when we think. You know, waiting doesn't mean you close up everything else and just wait for the person to walk into your life. But continuing to focus and doing what you need professionally, spiritually, financially, 
emotionally, uh, as part of your learning, um, as part of building connections with people, continue doing that. That, that is something that doesn't get aborted. OK, uh, the next part of, uh, OK, I'll just stop here for a couple of minutes. Any thoughts, any questions thus far? Very quiet class today. Is everybody awake? Is everyone awake? Thumbs up. OK, thank you, Anthony. Thanks. All right. OK, so we, we'll move on to the next part of it, which we're looking is about marriage. OK, marriage. Now, uh, let's let's understand and see that, you know, um, uh, the, the, the fact that, that Matt, I think someone has a question. OK, yes. All right. OK, so um, when we're looking at marriage, remember, it is just not the wedding ceremony. Okay? A lot of people are very excited about what happens in the wedding ceremony, which lasts for a day or maybe two or in some cultures, maybe a week, I guess. OK, the the marriage is definitely a lot more than just the wedding. So the wedding ceremony definitely is uh, is a is a is a wonderful, pleasant, memorable event where uh, uh, you and the person you're going to marry comes and shares vows, exchanges vows, and with God as witnesses, being united. It is the beginning. It marks the beginning of your life together. Okay. While there may be a lot of planning and things and excitement towards that, it shouldn't take away from, from preparation, from preparing for the marriage. Okay, It's important to prepare for the marriage just as much, uh, a, a lot more um, than just preparing for the wedding. Okay, Because I think when people get into this marriage preparation, into you know the the details of the wedding takes a lot more of significance, but it is through that you are actually preparing for the marriage. Okay, so um, remember that marriage, as we've been saying over and over, um, it's more than finding the right person. So when we look at Proverbs twenty four three to four, it says homes are built on the foundation of wisdom and understanding. Where there is knowledge, the rooms are furnished with valuable, beautiful things. So deciding to get marriage and preparation for marriage are two different things. Once you have decided to get married, um, then comes the huge need to prepare yourself for marriage. And it is where you take time to do this. Because as Proverbs talks about, homes are just not built on a decision. It's built on the foundation of wisdom and understanding. And that wisdom and understanding comes from communication, comes from talking, comes from sharing one's heart, comes from coming to a place of conviction, a place of repentance, a place of commitment. So taking time to discuss and talk through the different areas we spoke about is extremely important. Um, it's also important to prepare oneself emotionally, to prepare financially, to prepare for what it takes to manage a home and a family, to build a home, to uh, look for to look for how uh, there can be changes that come as a result of marriage. Uh, being able to discuss what the relationships of the larger family looks like, what church looks like, what ministry looks like, what service in church looks like. So there, there can be many things that um, that needs to be discussed. So marriage is more than just finding the right person. You find the person, OK, but then it comes to actually talking and discussing and preparing for that. OK, so we'll uh, we move on to what to uh, uh, what happens in the engagement period. So now this again can be very different for uh, different cultures. Mm, for some cases, there may be a, dura a long duration of an engagement. For some, it's a few months to a few days. Um, there can be something like a formal engagement, or it's just a, or just a, a word that's been saying. 
it being said. But nevertheless, through that engagement period, there are certain guidelines uh, that we would like to uh, share so that, uh, you know, uh, th th we know what is expected of us. So the first guideline that we're looking at is um, to remember that to keep oneself sexually pure, to refrain from any sexual encounter during this time of um, engagement. That is to place a needed boundaries, um, you know, needed boundaries till the point of marriage, to keep oneself pure, to honor the sanctity of marriage, to honor the sacredness of that intimacy. So to keeping oneself pure, uh, in uh, in before marriage, during that engagement period, the expectancy is to keep oneself pure by not engaging in any encounter until you are married. Okay, the standards for those in ministry are definitely higher, um, especially for young people who are serving in in ministry or in their church. Uh, it is important to hold. Uh, this in great regard to hold this in stricter standards, right? Because if you look at First um, Timothy four twelve, uh, this is what Paul's telling Timothy. He says, "Don't look, don't let anyone look down upon you because you're young, but be an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, love, faith, and purity." So. Uh, as, as a minister, you continue to have your life be an example, be a role model to those because uh, you are being watched. As a minister, you are being watched and people learn from you and uh, you would want to hold those stronger standards. Okay, So um, uh, another guideline is to not play married. That is, until you're married, remember, you are not married. So, which means there are those boundaries that until the point of time that you are married, you as a person do not have an entitlement to the other person's um, body or uh, money or time or future uh, or any of that. So, you, you're you not uh, the, the, the in, when you're in a premarital relationship, you're, you need to still take care of yourself, stand on your feet, ensure that you're you're having a time with other people, uh, doing the things that God wants you to do. You do not revolve your life around this relationship. If, if you do see something like that happen, when there are some warning signs uh, where there is a lot of uh, manipulation or a lot of, um, you know, the person doesn't allow um, any kind of an interaction with others. If if you do find these things, um, you know it is important to resolve this and and to really consider keeping the marriage off till the point of time that you're able to discuss and work through some of these issues. Um, uh, often uh, people just keep getting into marriage with the fear of breaking away because of the kind of uh, kind of preparation or kind of things that have already already been done. But remember, it's always better to break up um, uh, an engagement rather than to live through a bad choice in, in your marriage. So what are some uh, red flags that a breakup of an engagement may be necessary? One is if the other person becomes uh, abusive, is very controlling, uh, extremely manipulative, uh, can uh, you know wants to hold on to things of your life and what you should do, how you should do it? That's an indication of a of a of a uh, of a trait of a of a poor personality trait. So that's one sign of a breakup. The second one is if they are being very emotionally dependent. Okay, for every emotion turning to the other person, that always wanting to be spoken to, wanting to be cared for needing to call, you know, and these are just some random examples, but, you know, calling them, uh, wanting to be called every morning, afternoon, night, evening, talking for two, three hours, uh, not allowing any specific space and, and being like an emotional crutch, that could be a sign. The third one is failing to carry certain responsibilities, whether it be in their job, whether other commitments, even preparation to marriage where you're not seeing a commitment 
on what was decided, that becomes a red flag. If there are um, differences in the way uh, you, uh, you are in your spiritual understanding and in your intimacy with God, if there is a, the, the maturity levels are, are very different, if there is uh, if there are the disciplines towards spiritual growing growth and maturity, you see that there is there is a huge uh, uh, lack. Even the understanding of, um, uh, of of what they see in their doctrinal understanding, all of that, if that becomes visible, uh, that's again a, a red sign. Any sort of problems that you'd see involving in addictions of any kind, whether it be substance or whether it be sexual addictions, that becomes again a red flag. And last, if there is, if you do find a disapproval of parents and 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 valid reasons that they give you. Uh, of something that they found or something that they understand, which you've been blind to see, uh, that could be another sign. Okay, so um, uh, we've, we've come to to really work through to see how do you make a choice, um, uh, how, how do you come to a place of writing down your expectations, um, what happens when you get engaged, what's important. Uh, period, working through preparing oneself as well as seeing um, any kind of potential problems at your time, at your engagement period in the in the other person. Okay. Uh, the next uh, part and the last part that we will look at is um, singlehood. Uh, am I? Uh, are you called to be? Uh, are you called to be single? Okay. So when we look at um, marriage, we know that by default, uh, marriage is a part of the Genesis Commission. By default, it is part of the Genesis Commission. As you would as you would read in uh, Genesis 1.28, uh, God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay? Um, it, is, it is part of it. However, uh, uh, you know, it, it is also important to consider that marriage may not be something that everyone chooses to do. Everyone and twelve, I will read that out. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Okay, all right. So um, we look at how uh, singleness uh, is can be a choice that you make uh, for God, or choice that you make for reasons for the kingdom, for purposes of the kingdom. Okay, so let's just read Matthew nineteen eleven and twelve. But Jesus said, not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace. Marriage isn't for everyone. Some from birth seemingly never give marriage a thought. Others never get asked or accepted. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you're capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. So we see uh, here how, how Jesus is talking about what can be some of the reasons why someone chooses to be single. Okay, And here Jesus points out that some may decide not to get married for kingdom purposes or kingdom reasons. Okay, uh, It's probably that they have chosen to keep themselves for um, a specific calling for God's kingdom. And as a result, has chosen to remain single, to be on their own. Okay, so singleness could be a choice that you make. For um, am I audible? Sean is not able to hear me. Am I audible for the rest? Yeah. Okay. All right. If there is something you're not able to hear, um, would you would you please just put it up on the chat? I can I can respond. I can respond to that. Okay. So we were looking at singleness. 
being a choice so that you can make for kingdom purposes. The next we see is that singleness is a gift. Uh, as we see, not all, um, uh, not all uh, remain single, but it's a gift. And you see, Paul um, uh, ha has remained sing single. And he does say in these, which we'll read, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, chapter 7, some of these verses, he speaks, he explains that the ability to do so is a gift. Okay, and uh, and that's something that comes. The equipping of of uh, being single comes from God Himself, and um, that maybe not everyone has the ability or the empowering to be single, and so there is no sin in getting married. So we'll just read that, and I'll take your question, Nina, after that. First uh, Corinthians seven seven to nine and twenty eight. Sometimes I wish everyone was single like me, a simpler life in many ways. But celibacy is not for everyone any more than marriages. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of the married life to others. I do, though, tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might well be the best thing for them as it has been for me. But if they can't manage their desires and emotions, they should by all means go ahead and get married. The difficulties of marriage are preferable by far to a sexually tortured life as a single. But there's certainly no sin in getting married, whether you're a virgin or not. All I'm saying is that when you marry, you take on additional stress in an already stressful time, and I want you to want to spare you if possible. So Paul talks about it being a gift and uh, being empowered only by God to be to have uh, to be single, and that everyone um, is not in a place of being uh, single. And if it is far better to be in a place of uh, of marriage rather than uh, to have temptations um, and succumbing to that, right? Uh, yes, Nina, I think you have a question. Nina John, did you have a question? Nina, would you like to share your question? Okay, I think. Uh, all right, it's by accident. Okay, never mind. All right. So we look at the third one. Um, the third third point is that singleness is a choice. Okay, um, singleness. So we, we looked at how singleness is a choice that you make for uh, for for reasons of the kingdom. Singleness is a gift, and singleness is a choice that you make on on pursuits of um, on spiritual pursuits. So we do see that marriage definitely brings about a lot of responsibilities. And so, um, uh, and, and, so and, and some may want to live a life of singleness so that they could focus their complete attention on what God wants them to do and to live that life in service to what God desires of them. So even though, so I think over here, we, we'll just read that passage out. That even though marriage can have and has many responsibilities, it is not a, an inferior state, okay, uh, compared to that of singleness. Uh, it it just talks of the choice that you make. If there's something else that you want to pursue, uh, Paul says, you know, go ahead and do that. But there isn't a one is better than the other uh, situation here. Okay, both are are equally honourable. And uh, singleness becomes a choice. So let's just read First Corinthians chapter seven, verses thirty-two to thirty-eight. Would someone else like to read this this passage, please? Somebody else? Sean, would you like to read the passage? First Corinthians seven, thirty-two to thirty-eight. Okay, Sean's not there. Nina Santosh? 
Nina Santosh, can, would you mind reading First Corinthians 7? Yes, yes, Pastor. Yes. Second Corinthians 7. First Corinthians. 32-38. First Corinthians 7. But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly towards his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus I must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in, the, in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has no uh, determined in his heart that he will keep his, his virgin doing well, so then he who gives her, her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. Thank you, Nina. All right. So through this passage, we see that the kind of uh, responsibilities a person in marriage does have. So it says there are there are many things that a person in marriage, the attention gets moved to. However, uh, singleness, if, some, if, if anyone is convinced to singleness, choosing a life of singleness, they can continue to focus on their attention on pursuing God. So... The choice of singleness comes uh, as it, it comes as a choice because you want to pursue things for God. You want to pursue God and the things of God. You want to pursue kingdom purposes, things to do for the kingdom, or it is a gift that you have empowered yourself, uh, that God has empowered you for a life of staying single. Okay, so uh, it's good to ask yourself these questions. Okay to see if you are you are called to a life of single, singleness. So do you feel that you are empowered to be single and have the strength to remain single at, at the rest of your life? Okay, if, what, what, uh, if you have an answer, if, if the answer to that is yes. If you feel that there is, that God's calling you to a specific purpose, a kingdom purpose, for which that um, you know, if you if you do get married, you would not be able to pursue freely what God wants you to for that for the kingdom, because there are responsibilities for the marriage and family. So, would that be a yes? And third, is that a place you want to devote all of your energy, your time, your um, your resources, so that you could live uh, a life in service to God? So, if if there is a yes in all of these questions, then you're likely that it is likely you could consider a life of singleness. You know, otherwise, uh, moving ahead to really consider and um, preparing ahead for marriage is is what is needed. Okay, so we've come to the end of that uh, of this this chapter. For those of you who I mean, for all of us sitting on this call, I would recommend you know do a, a do an application. If you look at the end of that chapter, that entire chapter has a couple of questions of um, writing down your expectations in marriage and expectations of the person you marry. So, for those of you who aren't married, this is an excellent exercise to do. And for those of us who are married, it's an excellent exercise for yourself to. Uh, rework or to re-engage with your spouse about expectations in marriage, what you would like to see in the future years you are together, 
of how you would like to see your family, how like to see your marriage building up. Maybe it hasn't been in a place where um, you've never had a had an opportunity to discuss these expectations, but um, uh, this can be a time where you are actually, um, you know, doing that. So you are reworking some of those expectations and establishing a better relationship going forward. Okay. So for those of us who are married, we continue to keep our spouses. Okay. It is not. Um, it, even if it didn't match up to your expectations, it is a call to you to, to, to revisit that again, to reconsider and uh, bring back that conversation with your spouse so that it can work towards what your marriage can work towards what, what God's calling you to do. Okay. All right. I think uh, Jacqueline has, uh, has a question here. According requested some clarity on First Corinthians seven twenty-eight. Okay, I'm just going to pull up that verse, uh, Jackin. Just give me a minute. Shall I read it? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. Okay, so your question is, Paul writes that marriage invites trouble and has confirmed stress with it. But isn't it actually given by God for fellowship, friendship, and love? What thought is Paul telling us here? Okay, so... For the fact that, um, uh, so I think what Paul's bringing about here is that um, uh, that when you, when when you come together in marriage, definitely there are responsibilities. There are different things that need to be done. Which which number one starts with um, getting to know the person, understanding each other learning to know differences, um, you know, working towards building a home, working towards taking care of finances. Then comes uh, the, the um, childbearing, uh, uh, working with, with the children, bringing them up in the ways of the Lord, taking care of their personal needs. So what, what he's trying to bring about here is that there are these stress that is going to be there. And there is there are times of conflict that is going to come. So even though this was established to build, like you said, fellowship, friendship, and love, with it also comes its challenges. All right? So he is looking at it from the perspective of um, when, when he's comparing it with singleness, when it compared to singleness, these kind of responsibilities or stressors are minimized because you are an individual working towards the pursuits of God. You're not, uh, your, your attention is not wide with other things of taking care of a marriage and its response or a family and its responsibility. So in comparison to this is what he is talking about over here. So it is something that can be uh, filled with responsibilities and uh, stress. Um, nevertheless, if you are at a place where, as Paul, if you are going to pursue something of God, he recommends, he, say, he says, right? Um, uh, I want you to spare. Okay, that's what it says in my version. I'm just trying to pick it up from another version. Uh, just ask, give me a minute. Um, yeah, so it says, uh, if it's, nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. So he's saying, those who marry will have physical and earthly troubles. And I would like to spare you of that. So, so what he's comparing over here is a virgin, or that is someone who is a single, as against someone who's married. It's it's not something that he's he is saying against marriage, but saying if you are pursuing things of God, then being single would help you in that pursuit greater than 
being married with the with the responsibilities it brings. Is that clear, Jacqueline? Jacqueline, is that clear? Oh, yeah. Right. It, okay. it does. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Uh, any other questions on this? If not, I think we could close. Next week, we will be um, going further in detail about elements of marriage. We looked at a preparation, uh, building a base, a strong biblical foundation, and now we will be getting into the elements of a good, healthy Christian marriage. Okay. If there's nothing, let's we could just close with a word of prayer. Uh, can I request one of the students to close in prayer? Someone who hasn't spoken today. Anybody? Uh, Prabhu, Prabhu Manikam, would you like to close in a word of prayer? Or Shiva Kumar? Okay, Prabhu's mic is not working. Shiva Kumar? Or Sean? Gina, I can. Go ahead, go ahead, Rabbi. Thank you. I think Shivakumar is praying. Shivakumar, are you praying? Okay. So, yeah, Thank go ahead, Rabbi. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Jesus, um, for this wonderful session, oh God. Thank you for uh, everything that you spoke to us today through um, through Jean, oh Father God. Thank you for all the discussions we had, all the um, things that we need to work on, Jesus. We pray, God, as we go back and reflect on the things that we heard and we learned today, that you give us the wisdom and clarity on uh, on how we need to do it, Lord Father. Uh, we pray, God, that we will be able to... Um, practically apply these things in our lives and uh, with with your help that we'll be able to go forward and learn things more. Uh, we thank you for all the students uh, who are in the class today. We I pray God that you help them, you guide them and give us wisdom uh, to carry it forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, Ravali. Thank you all students. God bless. I meet you next week. God bless. <laughs>